Oh my gosh. Well, friends, welcome. It is officially our start time. Okay. <laughs> so to all those who have joined while we've been kibitzing and playing with our technology, uh, welcome. Welcome, welcome to our third session of Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Uh, I don't have introductory remarks today. I think, Bob, you have some thoughts that you might want to share with us as we dive into stave three to set the stage, so to speak. Well, there was a wonderful question that was asked at the end of the last session, and we said that we'd come back to it. And how could this all happen in one night and still there be three nights and maybe more nights because uh, as Roy pointed out uh, to me, <laughs> there are 12 nights of Christmas in the Christmas presents. So that's a lot more nights. And so I thought I would just say a few things that'll seem very far removed at first, but then try to tag them in to the overarching temporalities that apply in the Victorian period and to this book. So if I can get my little uh, chart up on the screen, Mother Rebecca? For sure, give me just a moment here. The, the Greeks, and I don't know very much about the Greeks, but, but the Greeks had uh, two words for time. And one word was chronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S. And, and we have that word still in things like chronology. Logos means writing or word. So the writing of time, chronology, uh, and chronology is day by day by day by day. That's what all those A's are. It just goes along day after day after day. We're in kind of a chronos time with COVID-19. And we were laughing before we turned to all the audience about just the way in which the, the, the days are almost uh, inseparable. We can't remember which day something happened because it's been the same all along, you know? And then Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, is the word that comes down to us as crisis. That is, it's a particular moment when suddenly time changes, something happens, something jerks you out of that day, 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 and into something else. And so you'd have day, 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 day in a crisis, and the new normal would be different from the old normal. So then you had B, 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 crisis, and then another change, and C, 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 crisis. So in Kronos, you've got a, a, a literal and progressive uh, undistinguished kind of procession. And with Kairos, you have special moments that and befores and afters. Kairos moments are what call eras. I remember this era before I got married, and then it was a different era after I got married. Or 9-11 changed all our lives forever and in many, many different ways. So those two kinds of time um, collaborate with one another and collaborate in our capacity to conceive of time and to remember time. In a way, the ghost of Christmas past was picking out the Kairos uh, elements in, in Scrooge's past. We didn't see him every day in the counting house. We didn't see him every time he went out on a date. We just saw the moments when something broke, something make a difference, whether it's Fezziwig's ball or the night of, of Marley's death. And oddly enough, as I got to thinking about the second stave, um, the, the, these events that we see, these crisis moments in Scrooge's life are about every seven years. He's a young boy in school in the first one when he's reading. Uh, so he's got to be old enough to have re read. He's, a, a, maybe an adolescent at the point where he gets taken back into the home by Fran. He's certainly in the apprentice years between 14 and 21 when he's at the Fezziwigs and then he gets started in his business and breaks up with his fiancee and then you see him on the night of, of uh, Marley's death and that is seven years ago from the opening of the, the, the carol. So uh, there's just these, these sort of Kairos moments. And Fred kind of says it all in stave one. He says, I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it has come round as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time, a kind of Kairos moment I know of in the long calendar of the year, Kronos, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave. 
and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. So we're all bound on these journeys, these Kronos journeys, but there are Kairos moments in it. But there's another kind of time that's happening in this too. Christmas time when it has come round as a good time because we have in Christmas every year a repetition of a crisis moment. And we have in our earthly history, one kind of time, which is Kronos, which is geologic time, the Triassic, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on for thousands of years. But in religious time, if something happens at a particular moment, one tends to date one's life from that moment. Jews date life from a calculation of when Adam when, was born. And so there are five and 6,000 years in the Jewish calendar, for example. Uh, Muslims date it from the time of the coming of Muhammad. And we date it from the coming of Christ. So our calendars, and in fact, world calendars now, date a, our time on earth, BC, before Christ in AD Anno Domini. So, and what we're talking about in Advent is these three times of Christ's coming in the past, in the present, and to come. And those are those kind of Kairos moments in a chronological progression of time. So that, that is the largest kind of overarching context and if I haven't explained it clearly, I hope my colleagues here will do a better job for me. But it's, it's one, one thing I thought, one place where I think we could sort of think about the, the interruptions as being the significant moments. But, and one other little tag on that is that we can't ever connect memory with present. You do memory in an off moment of, of mod, you know, thinking, you know, praying, whatever. And so Scrooge goes to sleep uh, between the ghost of Christmas past that he tries to extinguish and the ghost of Christmas present. But at the end of the ghost of Christmas present, it's right into the future. The one time we can't ever really capture and stop is now. Now is always just happened or about to happen. How do you live in now? And that's the third stanza. That's excellent. To, to the point at which this is an exploration of how Advent is present in a Christmas carol, um, it, th this whole conversation about this whole idea, this notion of Kairos and Kronos is, I mean, Advent is, um, is the season in which we ponder the lay layering of time in upon itself. So, uh, Advent means coming, and we are invited to consider the coming that happened and the coming that is still going to happen in the future of Christ um, in the eventual day, but also the coming that happens to us uh, pervasively and perpetually in and amongst our community in the ways that Christ is made known now. So Advent is this understanding in which Christ came and will come again and is coming even now. Um, so time is constantly layered in upon itself, um, marked by that first coming, um, concluded by that eventual coming, but pervaded by um, the, the um, constant coming all the time. Great, thank you. Harking back to that very last question before we dive into this third uh, stave, as if I recall the question correctly, it was about trying to understand if what is happening is truly happening. In other words, that, that there's this strange playing with time that Dickens is doing in the midst of the narrative, such that Scrooge goes to bed on Christmas Eve and at the end, spoiler alert, wakes up on Christmas morning. But in between the going to bed and the waking, he experiences a cycle of three days. Right? Maybe, maybe more. He makes yeah. well, yeah, because it's 12 days in stanza in stanza three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. 
So he, he, but he wakes and meets a new spirit on three new days. And then with the spirit that we're going to talk about today, he spends 12 days. So, but it's, so it's like for the whole rest of the world, time is totally frozen while he undergoes this transformation. Mm-hmm. And, and he'll say that, he'll say that um, in the fifth stave, oh my God, they did it all in one night. They did it yeah. all in one night. I mean, it's, it's, cause that's not the plan. When Marley comes, he lays it out three different evenings, right? And so Scrooge is just absolutely over himself that he actually is able to experience Christmas day um, when he wasn't he expecting it. Yeah. yeah, he didn't miss and, it. Oh, right. Right. We can read all this in one day or one night. So we ourselves have gone through the Scrooge experience oh, of seeing yes. all of these times yes. in our present. Absolutely. It's like, it's like how- and Every right, right, year right, for Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Kairos and Kronos, right? I mean, it's like, right, how can, how can it happen all, how can, how can 12 days happen all in one night? Well, it's interesting, right? Because 12 days can in fact happen for Roy, 12 days can happen just about 30 to 40 minutes as I read through this stave. Mm-hmm. And so it's, a na- it's the nature of literature itself that, that it, it, it's a funny time thing, right? And so it, it itself, and yet again, to go back to one of my very first points, the whole point of this story is in fact not Scrooge and it's not Marley and it's not spirits. The whole point of this story is Bob and Roy and Rebecca and Casey mm-hmm. and anyone who reads it, that's where the real meaning of this story lies. And that's something wonderful. It Nothing is wonderful. wonderful can happen. Happen, exactly. And wonder is <clears throat> wonder is what you can't explain. Wonder escapes explanation. I mean, there's no explanation for Jesus in some ways. I mean, it's beyond our credibility. That's right. Um, that this could all happen. And we've all been reading about it and writing about it for 2000 years. I, I would love to stick with that Roy for just a minute. Cause that was, that's one of the things about this particular stave um, that, that, that moment and it, and it's a, it's a pulling at the heartstrings moment, right? The, the moment when Scrooge is sort of seeing tiny Tim and um, uh, having, you know, his, his heart plucked as are, as is the reader uh, by this, um, uh, by this, by this weak and sickly child, um, and Scrooge is 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 sort of feeling sorry for him, and he says, um, he says, "Oh no, kind spirit, say that he will be spared." And the ghost of Christmas present says, "If the shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then?" If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus surplus population. Scrooge has this moment, not altogether unlike the moment he has with Marley at the beginning, where he's like, go easy on me. Like, you take care of it or whatever. Um, You do the thing. Here again, he's saying to the spirit, like, somebody do something about this. (laughs) Somebody fix this. Isn't isn't this going to end up happy? And it's this moment at which you realize that, as the first spirit said, The whole thing is about his reclamation. And you realize um, it's not really only his reclamation. Um, It's not only about his personal and unique transformation, Scrooge's that is. It's not, to your point, Roy, it's not only about you, Scrooge. It's about Tiny Tim. It's about the children lurking within the Ghost of Christmas Presents robes. It's about all of the, the people down in the mine, it's about, you know, the, the guys out on the ship, it's about all of it. It's about the whole sort of like, um, it's about the whole world. That the reclamation in mind is not, is not just one person, is not just you. So I, I think you're spot on with that. And it's not just in the 1840s, it's in fact in 2020. Oh. Absolutely. Right, for sure. Uh, it, it is really about us as readers too, and our responsibility to, it's not somebody else's job to fix Tiny Tim. Um, it's not gonna happen magically. Like the spirit waves his, his, you know, his cornucopia over it, but it doesn't like cure the, the system of, of, um, of poverty. Um, it's gonna be up to the, the changed behavior, the changed reality of people like Scrooge and a whole lot others to do something that, that um, affects this, this situation. 
it's re it's really funny, right? Again, for me at least, the, the the central image of this state for me at least is that ending with the two children, right? <clears throat> and it's it's because Scrooge looks at them and he looks at the spirit. And he says, "Are they yours?" Yeah. Right. No, they are man's. Right. They are humanities. Yeah. That's who they are. Right. Um, it, it, and so it's not it's it's not about the spirit. It's about, in fact, in this particular case, it is about Scrooge, but it's not about his feeling better. It's about his actually doing something about those damn kids. Excuse my language, right? It's do, doing something about it, you know, so, yeah. So, um, and, and I don't want to harp completely on this, but this is such an important point. I'm so fascinated when I went back to find, not that I can show you any of these video versions because my stupid thing won't work, but um, I went and visited a bunch of the cinematic depictions of A Christmas Carol to look for how various film adaptations show the ghost of Christmas present um, unveiling ignorance and want. And a number of them do not include it at all. Great. So it's this idea in which in the sort of popular Christian mythology of, of an American nation, your faith is only about you. Right. It is about your decision. It is about your salvation. It is about your personal relationship with Jesus, and that's it. And um, and whether or not you have that individual choice and that individual salvation. And so when you read A Christmas Carol, it's all about, is Scrooge going to be saved or is Scrooge not going to be saved? And Isn't this such a good story about a person like being saved? Except that's not what Dickens is actually trying to, the point he's trying to make is not only about Scrooge. He's trying to like lay claim to, to a bigger kind of reclamation than Scrooge's personal salvation. He's trying to sort of um, uh, influence um, the whole world. And I just find it so telling that these cinematic depictions omit that entirely and focus in exclusively on Scrooge and what happens to him uniquely. Uh, because I think that's so sort of um, aligned with popular American Christianity. And, um, and we know that Dickens was making a bigger point that I think is the bigger point of Christmas, of salvation, of the gospel, um, that it is about all of us. It, 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 the 1840s was a terrible time in Britain. And in the early part of that decade, uh, there were a lot of mining accidents and Parliament began inquiring into the condition of the working people. And Queen Victoria was very interested in this and was very much promoting a, a thought about changing some of these conditions. And Dickens kept saying from 1841 on that he wanted to write some hammer blows uh, in favor of the poor and their conditions. And what worried him most of all in the mines and manufactories of Britain was there no education. And the kids not only couldn't know how to read or write, but for Dickens, what was most important, they had no, uh, no, no sense of morals or ethics at all that was taught. No, no sense of the Sermon on the Mount as, as a, the, the way a, a, a Christian nation guided itself. And so you both are so absolutely right in seeing that and seeing that what he wanted to do was to change the whole way people who read this thought about their social construction mm -hmm. and you know of course the marxists came down and said hey it's you know it's it's um, part of the way things the the way the economic pie is divided but dickens was looking at something else and it, it, it also included morals and ethics and and feeling you, you kept talking of all of you about the sentiment that comes out in this middle stave and the Cratchit feast, which is so, uh, so many people uh, love so much and that never happened. And, mm -hmm. and so we have to ask ourselves, when did it happen? It yeah. happened oh. every time in the present <laughs> that we read it. And even in the films, if they get that right, as they don't, but the ignorance and want was really what he was leading up to. And at some point, I'd like to go on about that, but I've talked enough for now. Well, so what I'd like to do is, is have us jump now into the, the text of the third stave um, with that foundation laid. And Bob, I'm going to put up the images that you mentioned. I'm going to share the images um, that you wanted to talk about. Does that sound? This is just quick. Yeah. Um, here we are. That first image with, as you guys have pointed out now, the face and the candle, which is to be anticipated in the face of 
the ghost of Christmas uh, past. But this is Marley's reception room, it would be called. It's the front room or the, you know, uh, the living room, but he doesn't live much in his house. And you'll see a stone fireplace, a uh, great petrification of a stone fireplace with the hearth and the little coal fire and the mantelpiece and the paneled wall behind and the chair that Scrooge is sitting in and the little bowl of gruel there. And I can never tell whether that's a puff of of heat from the gruel bowl, or it's just a design in the uh, arm of the chair, the back of the chair, and a candle, a big candle, which is glowing uh, in its own right, along with Marley. And if the candle is also speaking to all the other spirits that Marley is in touch with there, that's really cool. Um, and his coattails are flapping. So this is the first visitation and the wall is solid behind and the table is there and you have Marley on the right and Scrooge by the fireplace. Okay, and not much on the floor. All right, Second. let me just go forward. There you go. There we go. Now Scrooge is in the place where Marley was before and the bowl of smoking hot liquor is in the middle of the table uh, and the ghost is sitting in the place where Scrooge's chair would have been. And the fireplace is just roaring with heat and light and the, uh, the, the, the torch, which doesn't really look much like a cornucopia, uh, but, but uh, the, the text says it did. And the holly up above, but then here's all this food below. And I'm, I'm still not sure what this thing at the very bottom is. It's got a rabbit's ears and it's got a, an upside down leg on the other end. And I've looked at it and looked at it. If anybody can figure it out, help. But there is an enormous part of this second, of this third, pardon me, stave that's about eating. Um, eating, eating, eating. We go through the marketplace and, and the onions wink at the ladies that go by and all sorts <laughs> of things. This is abundance. Yes. This is enormous abundance. It's all there. And it comes out of the, 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 the torch when Scrooge and, and the Ghost of Christmas present go around uh, or out of his hand, we sprinkle a little thing on people. Um, and we, we're going to want to think about that because this is the refutation of the pie theory. Mm -hmm. There That's is right. plenty for everyone right. uh, and uh, variety uh, among other things mm -hmm. and this stony fireplace behind and next week we'll get on to stones I hope but that's that's a really wonderful image and John Leach didn't read very carefully the illustrators for Dickens's Christmas stories never really read properly and John Leach painted the watercolor design for all the colorists with a red robe on the ghost of Christmas present mm. instead of the green one, which has such significance. Um, and the Morgan Library in New York has that painting. And when they do a Christmas book exhibition, they blow it up hugely the size of a door with this red robed feature. Uh, and so, so sometime if anybody gets a chance to go to the Morgan Library at Christmas when they're doing that, it's really quite a stunning uh, change. But there it is, and I just want you to keep all that in mind as we. But as as uh, as Father Michael in one of his questions so uh, poignantly uh, um, uh, focuses in on within this extravagant abundance, which is the the sort of constant theme of the um, uh, of the whole stave, lurking within the robes of that bearer of extravagant abundance, um, hidden hidden behind the robes uh, is want and ignorance. So somehow um, what we see is the abundance, but um, uh, concealed um, within it is, um, is the shadow side. I mean, we, we talked about this in our preparatory things about th this whole Malthusian philosophy that there's only so much and there's gonna be overpopulation. And so we've got to dole things out carefully right and and the third stave is yet again just like bob said is a refutation of that in fact there is plenty there's plenty there is plenty of food in our i'm talking about right now 2020 there is plenty of food in our world and yet there are hungry people 
Yeah. And so the question isn't, oh, how can we make more food so that there can't be any hungry people? The question is, why is there hungry people when there's so much food? Right. Well, there's the end of the stay right there. Yeah. Who's are they? That's they are they are man's right. Not want, uh, but the more bigger danger is ignorance. But actually, in this stave, there's want too, mm -hmm. and it's the cratchit dinner. I, I think you might want to talk about some other things before we get to the cratchit dinner. But, but then we'll let us look at that. The thing that struck me as I started focusing on this image, Bob, as as I read again last night, having known that you wanted to refer to it is how different Scrooge's behavior is from the morning when he wakes up with the first spirit and then the morning here in stave three where he wakes up to this spirit. So if we remember back to stave two, Scrooge is huddled in his bed. He's not sleeping because he's terrified this spirit's gonna come. And when the spirit comes, the spirit pulls back the bed curtains but only where his eyes are, as if to just, just start teasing him into seeing the world the way it should be. Uh, and, and he goes quite unwillingly with that spirit. In stave three, Scrooge himself pulls back all the bedcloths. So there is, there's a change in his behavior right from the beginning. And then the spirit doesn't even come in to his bedchamber. The first spirit, the ghost of Christmas past, came into his bedchamber, pulled open his bed curtains and took him away. This spirit sits in the, uh, what did you call this room? The, uh, the reception room. Reception room. Uh, I don't want to use living room because he doesn't live there. Doesn't live there. He would receive. Exactly. Yes. But yes. this spirit sits out there and Scrooge waits and waits and waits and finally, decides to get out of bed and go and look. And it's like a child who waits and waits and waits in bed on Christmas morning and goes out and opens the door and cannot believe what they see. And he looks out into his reception room. He cannot believe the abundance he sees there because he's never lived that way. Um, it's, really, it's really fantastic. Something that I would, uh, some, a major theme um, that I saw throughout uh, the stave is the is the theme of of knowledge and ignorance mm. of 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 seeing and blindness um, and it and it's right here at the very beginning for me at least yet to attend the two the two sort of pillars that hold up this stave is that ending with wanted ignorance and we'll come to that I'm sure eventually at the end of this uh, but then the first one is where 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 Scrooge waits and waits he waits for 15 minutes I think he waits in the darkness for 15 minutes and there's a light around but he can't tell what the light is he, he's expecting something to happen and nothing happens he's expecting something to happen right? He's expecting something to happen, but nothing happens, right? Because he knows the way this is going to work now. The way this is going to work, right, is that he's going to be in bed, and there's going to be somebody that's going to appear, because he, he knows. He knows how this is going to work. Yeah. No, he doesn't know how this is going to work. That's the whole point. He doesn't know. In fact, by the time we get to the end of the stay, we know that we notice that, in fact, Scrooge doesn't know much at all, um, right, and so he gets up finally. He, he and he goes right to the door, and he comes in. And this is the, the first thing. The first thing that the the first thing that the spirit says to him is, "Come in!" <laughs> exclaimed the ghost. Right, the first the first spirit came to him, but this one demands that he come to it. Right, come in! Exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Yeah. Notice. Know me better, and then again, there's so much there, but know me better, man. Mm. Notice at the very end, are these yours, spirit? They are man's, uh -huh. right? Mm. Um, come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been. And though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirit. Look upon me. And Scrooge reverently did so. You see, Scrooge loves to be ignorant, right? He loves his ignorance. He loves not knowing, well, anything except money, right? Um, 
But this, the thing that happens in this state, and the thing that strikes me literally about this state is that there is so much that's not about Scrooge. I mean, it sort of comes back to Father Casey's point, right? Yeah. I mean, it sort of comes back that, that there's pages and pages and pages of just the, in the second stave, it was always about the interaction about how Scrooge is understanding this. But in this one, it's just talking about the stores. It's just talking about the Cratchits. It's even talking about lighthouses and ships. It's talking about the nephew. It's, ta it's talking, and it's just it just goes on and on and on and on not about Scrooge because in fact Scrooge is the one that's having to watch this and he's having to learn it because he doesn't know that these things are happening and so in fact he's at the very end right we have want and we have ignorance and the ignorance is the boy you know who's really ignorant uh -oh. in this Dave <laughs> oh. it's Scrooge Scrooge is the ignorance um, so yeah so anyway um, I, I guess love that at the very beginning come and know me better, man. Mm. <clears throat> there it is, right there. Ooh. It's a good thing. Shall we, sh shall we, sh shall we pass the offering plate around? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> you know, uh, again, I, I'm wishing I could show you these clips. Thank you, Barbara, for pointing out that copyrighted material can be shown on Zoom. But the, the Jim Carrey, the animated version, he just nails that sentence. It is filled with um, gravitas. It is, it's not, an, it's not warm. It's not like, come in and know me better, man. It's, um, it's, it is kind of threatening. Absolutely. Um, even Absolutely. in his joviality, even in his, um, you know, like hyper uh, Christmas abundant joy, um, the invitation to come in and know me is just, it is laced with a sort of subversiveness that is really great. And I think was what Dickens had in mind. It's even, even in all of the scenes, right? At the very end, right before the wanted ignorance, at the very end, it says that they go through, and again, this is just a sampling of where they visit, right? So this is just a few, but wherever they go, whether it's a bedside, whether it's a jail, wherever it is, it's always a happier place after they visit. Every scene um, ends happier, except for stave three. Right? Stave three does not end happily, yeah. right? Um, because yet again, yeah, he's not, he's, he's, by the end of the stave, he's not so ignorant. Yeah. Uh, he actually yep. knows about things. And for me, I got, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, me, myself, when I got to the end of this day, I was almost in tears. Mm -hmm. I realized how ignorant I actually am about many things. And again, I don't want to derail this, but how ignorant I am about so much of this world. Um, so anyway. Yeah. And I've loved being a part of your parish because of the ways in which you keep reminding us of our duty and our our obligation to reach out and to help food pantries and all of these other things. Um, we really seem to be trying to, to make our uh, effort count in, in the larger world. Could, could, could we look at the, the, the Cratchit Christmas? Sorry. I think we must. Yes, uh, I think we must. Because it's, it's, it's in a sense, you know, if you were an economist, you could really criticize this Christmas and many did. But it's, it's making do is all that Christmas is. Uh, and it is a game of gain and loss repeated, 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 repeated throughout the whole time. First of all, Martha hasn't come in from work. She's working Christmas morning, cleaning up from the uh, milliner's shop and uh, comes in exhausted and, you know, uh, and then, Dad's about to come in with Tiny Tim, and they say, "Go hide, Martha." And and when Tiny and when Bob comes in and he says, "There's a declension in his voice." Martha not coming on Christmas Day. I mean, you're ready to cry right there, and Martha can't stand it, so she comes out. Mm -hmm. So that brings the happiness back in. And Mrs. Cratchit is all worried that the, the goose is going to be stolen, or the plumbing isn't going to be enough, and so forth and so on. And it all works out. And she says, there's a wonderful, just, just a little word, a word that just is the one that rings for me in all this stave. Everyone had had enough. Mm -hmm. Now, 
if you've ever been in a, in, in a food anxious situation, to have enough is like a taste of heaven. It is heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. To have enough. Enough doesn't mean a surfeit. Enough doesn't mean growing up afterwards like princes die. It, you know, it's not bulimia. It's just to have your stomach full for once. And even when they have the drinks after dinner, it's a custard cup without a handle. And there are so many indications of this poverty, this, this narrow edge that they live on. Mm -hmm. And what really counts to make it good is the spirit that they bring to it. Um, they are always overcoming. And even when nobody in the family wants to toast Scrooge, Bob talks them into doing it. He is, in some practical way, the father of this feast. So uh, it's, um, sorry, it gets me every time. Just that word enough against the abundance. Uh, it may be there, but the, you know we're in poverty versus riches and the distribution is unfair. And what do you do? Do you complain when you don't have enough or do you make it enough? Mm -hmm. A mm. tiny atom left on the bone is enough. The the contrast um, of their exuber of their joy in their amidst their lack, um, and then Mrs. Cratchit, which I think is such an important little line. You know, she you, you feel you feel um, I feel always like yeah you get it Mrs. Cratchit when she's like slamming Scrooge. Yes. Yeah, you get yeah. him. And then she says, but then she says, he'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And it's like, oh, no, actually, no, you're, you actually are the happy ones. He's miserable. He is so deeply unhappy and has been for so long. So please, Mrs. Cratchit, don't, don't lose sight of what you have created in your, um, in your enough. I mean, she herself is sort of sucked into the the perspective that if you have lots of money, obviously you're happy. Exactly. And if you don't have much, you've got to really work to be happy. Right? Exactly. She herself is sucked into this whole stuff. Remember Fred's exchange with Scrooge in, stanza, in stave one, where uh, Scrooge says, you know, why are you saying Merry Christmas? You're poor enough. And, and Fred says back, well, why aren't you saying it? You're rich enough. You know? It's this play on the word enough. As I was, I, I didn't get to it as quickly quickly as I wanted, but uh, on the online version, you know, you can pull that up and then you can search within the text. Mm. And it was fascinating as I was trying to find this passage here where everyone had had enough yeah. to see all of the different ways that Dickens uses the word enough throughout the whole text. And I mean, I didn't have time to process it, but um, go, friends, go back and, and do that online and you'll see the way the word enough plays throughout the entire, it's not just in stave one, it's through the entire thing. Yeah. And it again is at the center of that, that household economy uh, competition in the 19th century and in the 21st century, you know, uh, which is whether it's a good thing for the poor to have enough, then they will reproduce and, you know, be hungry mouths to the, the, the pie. Uh, so don't don't give them too much. Yeah. Poverty is the way we control the the the, the ownership of goods. Yeah. Um, I uh, I I find um, Tiny Tim is obviously such an important sort of like iconic figure, um, right? So um, playing again on our heartstrings um, and and certainly heavily influencing. Scrooge's own trajectory. Um, but I had never noticed until this year uh, when I finally really paid attention to my footnotes in my good annotated version that Tiny Tim amidst all the Cratchit's merriment and they're all singing and taking turns singing songs, Tiny Tim sings a little carol. Um, and finally I paid attention to the fact that no such carol is known to exist. He sings a song about a little boy lost in the snow. So that's right. Um, which is such a downer. <laughs> um, I mean, it's this scene of joviality by the by the Cratchits, and they're taking turns singing, and and then Tiny Tim sings 
this song about a little boy lost in the snow, but, but no one has been able to figure out what that song would be, um, that perhaps it was an invention by Dickens um, himself, who just sort of comes up with a, a song and a theme for Tiny Tim to sing about. I love um, that G.K. Chesterton later wrote a poem uh, to come up with something, uh, a verse for Tiny Tim to sing. So this is, you know, decades after um, a, a car the carol is written, but Chesterton out of his sort of desire to sort of fill this um, story and have there be a, a focus of it, wrote it and it's absolutely lovely. And um, in his typical style, really quite sweet and profound at the same time. Um, and I commend it to you. I'll, I'll put it in the in the chat for everybody to read. But like, just kind of uh, among all the Dickens, like just saturated with images and lines that can easily just get run right through, and you don't even notice them. This is among them many among all of those. One of the ones that caught me this year. And that's interesting I, because I've always been moved by the Christina Rossetti in the Deep Midwinter, which we sing at Christmas time. It does start out in the snow, mm -hmm. so that there, 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 there might have been in the time, and Chesterton was a late inheritor of the Victorian period, uh, some, you know, kind of common thought about people stuck in the snow in the middle of winter, especially when the country was more agriculture. And if you're a farmer, you're gonna get your creatures out of the snow if you can and into the barn. And that's another way in which you're a good shepherd. I, I don't know, but it, I have a feeling that if you did all enough and wrote a paper on it, you did more about creatures in the snow at Christmas time, we'd have a super, uh, a super set of lectures and sermons. <laughs> I mean, but again, right, I mean, it crops up at the end. This is yet again, the child that's lost in the snow. I mean, this is ignorance yet again, right? So again, it's just, it's just masterful. Um, well, the, the Chesterton, I don't Chesterton, know. Chesterton writes it as, um, uh, well, it, it, it writes it imaginatively, not as the child, like a, um, a child of need or desperation, but as a child lost in the snow as, as the Christ child. So um, perhaps, per, perhaps. Um, it, it's wonderful and metaphorical. So, yeah. Just one more thing about Tiny Tim before we leave the Cratchit house. Um, and this is way back in stave one, right? The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk who in a dismal little cell beyond a sort of tank was copying letters. So Scrooge is, the door is open so that Scrooge can keep his eye upon, upon his clerk. At the end of the Cratchit, um, Scrooge had his eye upon them and especially on Tiny Tim until the last. But you see the way in which he looks at his clerk in stave one and the way in which he looks at Tiny Tim in stave three, it's a world of difference already, so. It, yeah. You know, um, malnutrition produces a lot of physical mm. uh, conditions. Um, and we've had many doctors try to say what was the matter with Tiny Tim. Uh, the, the trouble with reading Dickens is there's a level in which it just seems real. And so somebody in the medical <laughs> profession will say, okay, you know, if you just give him a little more vitamin C, you know, he'll be fine, you know. But of all the different kinds of things that malnutrition could produce, Dickens chooses to cripple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm in a story about a journey we all take. And mm -hmm. Tiny Tim is the one who can't take it without a father. Mm -hmm. And can any of us take that journey without a father? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it never, again, you guys have just been so wonderful. <laughs> that, that's what I got from listening to you all. Um, and, and the crutch remains when uh, Tim is gone. It's an icon there. Um, and we're going to have some more icons in the next stay that stay around. Sure. Those bed curtains are coming back. Mm -hmm. But the crutch is also, of course, yes, the bed curtains are coming. You're absolutely right. Um, of course. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> Oops, I lost the thought that was too brilliant. <laughs> uh, 
Because I don't know what you mean. I've never read that. What is that in the next? Is that a reference to something that I don't? Oh, I think that's <laughs> unofficial. I think that's probably an interpolation by a later writer <laughs> trying to cash in on the tarot. Yeah. Oh man, that's awesome. Mm. Oh, I know. The other thing, of course, was that what Tiny Tim says about his condition is related to our father. Uh, that because it's and, and I think disability people would be have a hard time with this. He says it might be nice for them to see me in church and think who did uh, cure the blind and make the lame walk again. Uh, and, and so he's a kind of icon of. Well, you, then you ask yourself. Well, he's an icon of Jesus's miracles, or the fact that Jesus has performed a miracle with Tiny Tim. What, what, how, how would you feel about a, you know, kid on a crutch coming into church? What, what would you? Well, it it doesn't allow us our ignorance. That's right. For Tiny Tim to show up in the church oh, forces us oh, out of our ignorance over oh, his situation. Beautiful. And he essentially knows that and says it'll do him a world of good for me to be there. Right, that's what I that's you know, think of. Absolutely, that's lovely. Ooh, I wonder about um, uh, the the flight that they take over like Cornwall and mm -hmm. out into sea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't really know what to do with it other than to delight in it and wish that more of the cinematic adaptations would do something with it and they'd skip right over it because of course they're all focused on the personal transformation of Scrooge. Um, but you know, is, I wonder what y'all make of the, the visit to the mine and the lighthouse and the ship at sea with the, uh, you know, Bob, as you put out, pointed out with these, these um, little um, bubbles of Christmas joy uh, that are e present even in these bleak circumstances. I mean, one thing that struck me is something that we mentioned at the end of the last stave, and that is that it doesn't matter how far you go out, whether it's a mine or whether it's a lighthouse or whether it's a ship, they aren't alone. Mm. right? There, there's someone there with him, right? Even in the lighthouse, there's two guys, but they hold hands and they, and they sing, you know? There's lots of, not only is there a lot of eating in this state, there's a lot of singing in this state as well. And there, there they are in the big middle of three miles from shore, but they're holding hands and they're singing, right? So, and on the ship, right? They're all there. I mean, they're all separate, but they're all together in a sense. Whereas Scrooge, we mentioned this last time, he's in something that's going to, spoiler alert, um, something that's going to come up next stage is that he's, he has nobody. Yeah. So. Uh, there's a, a biographical thing that kind of fits in here. Um, in the mining and manufacturing uh, investigations by Parliament uh, interested Dickens a great deal, and he participated in a lot of conversations about them. And at one point, he wanted to see the mines of Cornwall. So he wrote to one of the subcommissioners and said, tell me what the worst mines in Cornwall are. And I and my friend, John Forrester, and the illustrator of uh, sub subsequent Christmas books, a, a great uh, scene painter, will go down to Cornwall and investigate them. And <laughs> among other things, they were told that the bleakest, awfulest moment in Cornwall ever is theoretically Tintagel, the home of King Arthur. <laughs> so they went to visit that bleak spot. Uh, and they were warned that the Cornish mines had even greater numbers of fatality, though not among children and boys, than any of the mines in Yorkshire or in Scotland or Wales. So it was a scene that Dickens revisited um, to find out more about the mining and manufacturing injuries and deaths. Uh, and then, I've written some about this, Dickens is trying to single out the individual and the way in which an individual's fate is um, mm -hmm. of importance to and related to the fate of everyone. But to do the, to go from the individual to the many was often to jump into a utilitarian calculus the greatest good for the greatest number. And so you really erase individual need. And of course, the greatest number is always the people that count. 
and uh, one half of all the people in the world didn't count. They were called women. Uh, and children are also not counting. So it was men uh, with property. And that's who were the voters and that's who the people were that counted. So Dickens tries to find ways throughout his life to talk about individual lives that are never eclipsed by the generality, mm. but to show you the multiplicity of generalities, all doing something the same. And Jared Manning Hopkins has a wonderful poem about that. Each thing does one thing and the same, mm. deals out that being indoors, each one dwells, sells itself, My, it speaks and spells. And so Dickens can have that individual and at the same time say, look, this is going on all over the world. Yeah. Um, Mother Rebecca. And declining numbers of people, yeah. right? He, in these visits where he's showing him all over the world, he's showing him right. you know, a mining camp and then he's showing him a ship and then he's showing him a lighthouse. Yeah. Right. And he's you know, defeating that. It, it's only where the greatest numbers are. I'm sorry. Would it, no, no. Would it be possible for you to bring up the 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 image of the children at the end? Yes. I there, there's something that again this time reading it through. I'd never really paid attention. I'm sorry to say, but I'd never really paid attention to the images. Um, but the image at the end of the oh, don't do that one. Yeah, yeah. that one. Just no. Again, I had never noticed that. In fact, there's the children in the front, but in fact, in the back are the factories. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and so what what Scrooge? It's like well, where where are where are these children? Well, in fact, they're right back there in the factory. They're not in a sense. They're everywhere. They're all around you, Scrooge. You know. Um, and yet, when he when he pulls open the um, when he pulls open his robe and he shows them there, suddenly now he sees them because he hasn't seen them before. He's been blind to them. He he hasn't known them. He hasn't well. He hasn't actually. He's not even aware of them. Um, but here, um, I I just love that juxtaposition of we we have the end of and there's the individual, and there's the 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 mass right. Right there in that picture, I love it. So. That, that's very neat, and there is one little modification because mm. we noticed in Stave Two, Scrooge is melting and softening, and he asks the ghost of Christmas Present when he's in the reception room, "What was there a claw or something underneath oh, the robe right. at, at the foot?" And the ghost said, "You know, that's that's good." To <laughs> very few people have been curious enough to ask about what these indications are but let's leave that for the present okay. and but so let's scrooge leave, it for, the, let's leave it for the present but the way that scrooge travels with this spirit mm -hmm. is by touching the robe mm -hmm. he takes the arm of the first spirit but in every time that he moves from place to place to place with the ghost of christmas present he touches the robe <laughs> And I can't help but think <laughs> of how if we will just reach out and touch the hem of Christ's garment, we will be healed. There's yeah. the repeated touching of the robe continues to help open his eyes, it seems to me, until finally he touches it and it pulls back and he sees it all, ignorance and want. And, and I'll go ahead and take my stick and beat the dead horse that I've made that I that I've beaten before. But it's like when the children are revealed, in fact, they don't. Just, they're not. In fact, in fact, the picture isn't completely accurate because, in fact, they are. They are uh, from the foldings of his robe. It brought forth two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and they clung to the outside of his garment. So just like Scrooge clings to the garment, they cling to the garment because in fact, who are the ones that need something? Who are the ones that are ignorant of something? Well, it's Scrooge himself. In fact, he's looking at a mirror. So, mm -hmm. oh, God, I love this book. Why isn't this in the Bible? <laughs> if you wanted to replace Roy Revelation. Heller wrote the Bible. <laughs> I'm glad they don't let you loose with the New Testament <laughs> theology school. At the next, at the next ecumenical, at the next global ecumenical council, council, Roy, you can press for its inclusion in the canon. I'll make a motion. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it is uh, uh, unfortunately time um, for our uh, third session to draw to a close, stage three. Um, we will pick back up with stage four and um, all of its haunting. It's the most ghost-like of the three spirits um, in the sort of contemporary traditional spooky sense. Um, and, uh, and also um, continues lots of Dickens's themes. Anything that y'all are looking forward to talking about next week? I, I've never read it, so I don't know. I need to, I need to take a look at it. Uh, I have a stony heart for next week. A stone oh. coast, so pay attention to the stones. Uh, just a couple of questions as we think throughout the week that we haven't had a chance to address today. Sorry about this, friends, but um, Scrooge seems surprised by Christmas present sprinkling blessings on poor people and seemed to think they should go to rich people. So is that a part of the Victorian uh, notion of resource management? Just pegging these for next week, we don't have time today. The other is, what does it mean, oh, and I love this, that Bob Cratchit is finally named in this stave? Yes, no one's been named up to this point and among, among others, Bob Cratchit finally is this stave. So, um, uh, Diana and Ed Cooley posted that good catch. Um, those are important things to attend to, and and we will talk about those more next week. Although in the first stage, he has fifteen bob a week as oh. his salary, uh, mm -hmm. and so he's commodified. That's right. His name is commodified in the first stage. That's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, friends. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll pick it back up we'll next week. <laughs> Go in to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, indeed. Thank you all for my friends. Yes. Thank you for the audience, indeed. Mm -hmm.